Um, as you all know, we should have been in Cairo to have this seminar, and I welcome Dr. Shima Sohir here from the uh, ISTA designated authorities representing um, CASC in, um, in Egypt. Um, welcome. I also welcome to our today's session the ISTA president, Dr. Steve Jones from Canada, and our panelists here on the screen. It is the third part of this seminar, and it is um, actually dealing with um, technical topics on new detection methods and alternative control measures. Um, we will have uh, four panelists today, and um, we will start with section 2.2. The previous sessions, by the way, on regulatory aspects on plant health and on session 2.1, new threats, outbreaks, and regulations can be viewed on the ISTA YouTube channel. And this third part will be added to the ISTA YouTube channel as well um, um, within the next days. So this session is recorded. If you have any questions, um, we will have a question and answer session at the end. Please use the question and answer um, boxes to put on your questions. Uh, I thank all people present here and I would like to open this meeting today with a presentation of Ruth Balhorn uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, Root is um, working as a junior research vegetable seed health researcher at Nachtanbau in the Netherlands. He studied um, biotechnology and molecular biology at Van Hal Larenstein University of Applied Sciences and is a member of the Seed Health Committee of ISTA. Root, I hope I, trans uh, I, I did everything correctly because my Dutch is not that good. Um, Root, the screen is yours, and I think all the others should um, um, mute now our panelists and uh, switch off their cameras. Oh, you did a great job. Uh... Okay, thank you, Andreas. I'm trying to get the uh, my screen in view. Does does anybody does everybody see my screen or not yet? Yes, we see your screen. Hello. Yes, Everything is fine, Ruth. We can see your. You screen. see my presentation as well. Yes. yes. Perfectly. Ah, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, as uh, Andreas already told, uh, I'm Ruud Barnorn. I'm working at uh, NAC Timebau in the Netherlands, and I'm a member of the Seed Health Committee since two years now. And uh, I will present a. It's a little bit too quick. Okay, I will present you on the, how do I get back? Okay, well, we'll present you on the, the, the next generation uh, screening for pathogens on seeds and the effect on seed trade. And uh, my outline uh, will be, uh, of the presentation will be uh, the current seed health uh, testing methods and a uh, next generation uh, oh, I'm struggling a little bit with my presenting mode sorry for that a uh, next generation uh, seed health testing methods uh, sequencing to detect pathogens on seed samples a qpcr primer probe design using hts sequencing and conclusions and thoughts okay first to start with Well, ISTA, uh, current ISTA has uh, 30 
uh, reference protocols for uh, CTELF tests available on their website. And uh, they conduct of uh, pathogen, pathogens, uh, seedborne pathogens uh, uh, belonging to bacteria, fungi, viruses, and nematodes. And, oh man. Uh, for bacteria, we use uh, dilution plating uh, followed by if any suspects are found on uh, the semi-selective media that we use to check whether pathogens are available on seeds. Uh, then the suspect colonies are put into a PCR uh, isolation of DNA first, and then a PCR is conducted. And I will come back to what a PCR is for the people who don't know what a PCR is. Uh, by uh, well, mostly conventional PCR, so that's uh, an, well, a well gel-based method, and uh, or uh, pathogenicity assay is conducted to check whether the pathogen is pathogenic, yes or no. For fungi, uh, agar plating or uh, blotter assays are used, uh, which means actually that seeds are individually laying in clusters of 20 to 100 seeds on either agar, agar plates, growth me grow, growing media, or a blotter uh, uh, papers, and they are incubated for a uh, several times at, at a temperature, a specific temperature, and then after a couple of days, microscopic determination is done. And well, you can understand that with the microscopic determination, people need uh, uh, well very spe uh, yeah, specific skills on morphology there. For virus, uh, ELISAs are used. Well, I will not go into ELISA as the process itself today. Uh, for nematodes, uh, microscopic determination is also conducted with the special knowledge of the people who perform the work, and it's followed with uh, PCR identification. So uh, these are actually the methods uh, currently present, and now we're moving to a new era, actually, and it's already there for years uh, to be, but it's the uh, next generation seat of testers, as I would call it. And that uh, is uh, uh, on more uh, quantitative molecular testing. So, uh, and this will help us to, uh, well, fasten the, uh, fasten the, 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 the process of uh, checking and also um, yeah, make it more sensitive. So we can do that in two different ways. And the first one is uh, the suspect colony PCR, which I was already talking about. Well, it's currently for almost all tests that have a PCR for uh, confirmation in them. And that's most of them is uh, bacteria tests actually are, uh, are done on uh, agar gel, which is a quite time consuming process, uh, which also is uh, showing of well, uh, some irregularities and difficulties in scoring in the end. And uh, so uh, that is uh, now transferred to a quantitative PCR. Quantitative PCR is actually what you see, what you can see in the right here is a piece of DNA is uh, chosen to develop to detect. So we develop a sort of a marker region which is unique for the pathogen that we want to test for and uh, use that to multiply that region over time. And that's a uh, temperature-based cycles that, uh, that we use. And with the temperature cycles, uh, the multiplication of uh, this specific part of DNA is done when present. Uh, this is also done with uh, the conventional PCR. Uh, the only difference is that uh, we now can real-time, and that's where you see the curves at the right bottom, real-time, uh, screen and monitor whether a pathogen is there or no and what kind of concentration is there yes or no. So that's a, a real advantage because uh, you can uh, you, you can skip the uh, electrophoresis part for of the conventional PCR and that will help uh, uh, yeah, to fasten the process. Uh, for uh, fungi, uh, we're also in the process of developing these assays, and that's to prevent microscopic or morph uh, morphology uh, checking of uh, suspects. Uh, with this uh, 
PCRs, uh, we can, for fungi at least, and nematodes probably also, but for fungi, let's talk about fungi in this case. Uh, currently with morphological typification, we can only come to a, a, a subsample uh, level, but of, of a, sub, a sample level, a species level, sorry, species level, and with PCR, we can uh, go in deeper and even uh, identify uh, fungi on subspecies or part of our levels. And since we are uh, already uh, checking a colony which is growing, uh, we can, uh, well, we know that the DNA that we're, that we're looking, that we isolate, is from a viable pathogen. The second approach is actually even earlier in the process, and that's a seed extract PCR. So with uh, a seed sample coming in, uh, currently we uh, soak it or crush it in, in a buffer and then plate it on a, on a media for dilution plating in bacteria. With a seed extract PCR, you can uh, directly isolate uh, DNA from your seed extract, which is also this soaking uh, soaked seeds in buffer and do a PCR directly on that, and that prevents you to wait for time in uh, well, the dilution, uh, of the in dilution plating uh, for the growth of, the, uh, of this uh, bacteria. So it's a quick screening method. You can conduct it in, uh, in a very short time. It's highly sensitive, as I already told, and the only disadvantage there is that uh, since you're not growing anything, the viability of the pathogen is not uh, sure to be answered. So how does it look like? Currently, for fungi testing and bacteria, I have put uh, two examples there. So we get a seed sample in, and then we soak it, or we we'll pre-treat it uh, in a way that we can put it on a blotter, or we can plate them out. And then we have to incubate them for uh, seven to nine days for blotter, or one to five weeks for plating. And then after that, we check for uh, suspects, and if suspects are uh, available, then oh no, then uh, no, of course not. Sorry. And then uh, we grow them, and then the confirmation is done uh, by a morphological inspection, and that takes one day. So overall, it takes you quite some time to uh, do a fungi test. For bacteria testing, this is uh, somewhat similar. Um, now we do. Uh, Put, put a seed extract after soaking the seeds on a semi selective media plates, grow the bacteria, and after approximately six days, uh, a confirmation is done via pathogenicity assay. And that takes you about 15 days. So it's also almost three weeks and sometimes even longer to get to the answer if it is a healthy seed lord or it's an infected seed lord. So, how does it look like when we introduce the uh, seed extract PCR and the identification uh, via qPCR of uh, suspect colonies? Well, what you see there is that you, uh, if you do a pre-screen, you can do it in two days instead of the whole process uh, in in uh, yeah in 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 a couple of weeks. And this is only doable when your sample is negative. If you have a positive hit for your pathogen, then you need to request a new seed sample and go further with the uh, plotter plating or dilution plating for bacteria. And then if there are suspects present, you can do either go directly to the pathogenicity assay or do a PCR. And this PCR, uh, well, is more sensitive and more specific than the morphological inspection, takes the same time. So that is giving you a better and reliable result. Um, for bacteria testing, it, it takes uh, about a, a day longer since you have to grow, of course, your bacteria, your suspects uh, yeah, solidly and um, conduct uh, that. Uh, but uh, if, if that is positive, you can uh, directly say that it is an affected seed lot. Uh, and if negative, then you can say that it's a healthy seed lot. If it is uh, positive at PCR, then you have to do a confirmation, of course, of pathogenicity assay. Okay, to move on. Now, uh, there's a, a new approach coming into uh, pathogen detection, and, well, it's there already for years, of course, sequencing. 
but you have uh, different generations of sequencing. So you have your first generation sequencing that was originating from the 1970s when Frederick Sanger uh, developed a radioactive based uh, nucleotide sequencing method, which you have to manually uh, read uh, gel, uh, gels and uh, well with the radioactivity was not really high throughput and, and something to share. But in the 1980s, this uh, was picked up uh, by uh, several companies still doing Sanger and uh, they automated the process flow and turned the uh, radioactive nucleotides to uh, fluorophoric uh, labeled nucleotides. And also uh, these uh, gels were replaced by uh, acryl uh, capillars and uh, the automatic uh, result. Uh, well, sequence reads uh, could be generated. Uh, well, it's uh, it can it's able to do a 500 to a thousand base pair fragments of sequence. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the second generation, the next generation sequencing uh, came uh, into place. It's a more high throughput method, uh, which generates uh, 50 to 500 base pair fragments. And um, it's a bridge amplification on a silicon chip and uh, also uses fluorophore uh, nucleotides, which can, uh, yeah, um, are scored uh, automatically. And currently, uh, this is still used as D2 for sequencing, but there is some. Uh, developments going on constantly, of course, and these is the these are the third generation uh, sequence uh, yeah, methods. And uh, this first generation is a long read uh, sequences uh, can be generated to tens of thousands KB in fragments. And with this, uh, the benefit over the uh, the first of the short read sequencing, the first and the second generation, is that. Uh, uh, large repeat regions or very difficult to uh, read regions like GC rich regions are overcome by using uh, this uh, type of, uh, of uh, technique of this new gen third generation sequencing. Uh, the third generation sequencing, there are two devices uh, currently present, and that's the PAC Bio, which is actually a machine that is almost a room big, so it's uh, quite a big machine. Uh, and uh, there's also an Oxford nanopore system, and this nanopore system is no larger than a USB drive. So let's move on. So how can we use this third generation sequencing technique in uh, pathogen detection on seed? So here in the left bottom, you see uh, some uh, uh, cabbage sheets. And so this is a sample that we get. And this is, uh, well, if, if you put this in a buffer and soak it, then uh, you will get all kinds of mixed microbial uh, communities in your buffer. That's what you see over in the big circle with the, the red and the blue and the green and the yellowish uh, shapes. From that uh, uh, extract, DNA extraction is, uh, is uh, conducted. And then there's two possibilities that you can do for uh, detection via uh, sequencing. And the first one is, uh, if you already know what you want to detect, then you can go for amplicon sequencing, because then you already identify, uh, pre-identified regions of interest, uh, which are specific to certain pathogens. And then uh, you can check whether these are present in your sample, yes or no. The other option is that uh, metagenomic sequencing is that you don't know anything uh, at all of the presence of any pathogen in there and you want to know what kind of pathogens are in your sample. And uh, so that's what you see. The difference is that it, all, uh, it uh, sequences all genomes instead of uh, just fragments uh, selected. So there's no pre-selection uh, done. So how does this metagenomic sequencing look like? Well, here you see uh, the nanopore uh, sequence uh, device on the left corner. 
top corner. Uh, well, as I already told you, it's no bigger than a USB drive and you can put it in your pocket and take it everywhere you want. And uh, well, it's a pore based sequence me method and your DNA is actually pressed through the pore, lead it through the pores and every time a nucleotide passes the pore, a signal drop comes up and uh, can be read via the software that is uh, delivered with this device. And in the end, you will get uh, thousands and thousands of reads. And here on the right, you see an example of a part of, a, of, uh, of the genome of a bacteria, let's say. And what you see there, it's about 6,000 uh, uh, base pairs that you can see. And you see red uh, lines and blue lines. Well, the red lines are the ones that are uh, in, the, in, the, in the normal of the right, the, the, the left uh, direction, and the blue ones are uh, reverse complements. So uh, that's only saying something about the, the direction of the sequence reads. But what you can see there is that there's probably in this uh, lower, in the middle part, that's a harder region. So that's the region wh uh, where uh, fewer reads are, since uh, this is difficult. Uh, but in the end, there is reads enough to cover the whole genome of this uh, bacteria and uh, completes the puzzle, as you can see there in the left corner, uh, for this bacteria to, to have the full genome sequence. So uh, now an example on the metagenomics uh, uh, approach of just a sample. So once a day, we got a seed sample of faba bean into our lab, which had blackish spots on, uh, on them. And the question from the company who sent us these seeds was, uh, is there bean yellow mosaic virus present in these seeds, yes or no? And what else is present? Well, that's actually the question that we asked ourselves. So uh, we uh, did a DNA isolation of uh, faba bean seed extract and did a full genome sequencing. And the end result out of that was uh, all this sequence data is, is uh, well collected and put in a sort of a genomic uh, taxonomic pipeline. And what you see there is that there's in the seed extract there was a bacteria present, uh, quite a lot of eukaryotic uh, uh, DNA was uh, present in sequence, reads, reads of these uh, were sequenced. And this is logical, of course, because uh, we extracted it from these beans. And so this is primarily uh, Fica faba or uh, Pisum sativum, uh, uh, which is also uh, closely related to and actually belong to the same family as the Fica faba. Uh, reads that come up. But more interesting, of course, for us is the viruses part. So uh, if you look into that, uh, yeah, in, in, in that uh, cluster, you see that in the end, we yeah, did detect a highly, highly present of bello, uh, bean yellow mosaic virus. But uh, also something that we didn't expect was the uh, presence of uh, almost the same concentration of P seed borne mosaic virus. So if you would send in these seeds and only ask for us to check it with a bean yellow mosaic virus uh, and, and then send it and trade it to other countries and then uh, uh, suddenly an outbreak of uh, P seed borne mosaic virus can be, uh, yeah, can be uh, yeah, popping up uh, since uh, it was not tested for that virus. So uh, this is the only way to actually know what is there, uh, yeah, different from uh, checking for these viruses separately, of course. So what can we also do with uh, high throughput sequencing next to this uh, metagenomic? Well, as I described earlier, we're currently developing qPCR, quantitative PCR uh, assays, primers and probes, they call, to uh, identify uh, these uh, pet, uh, pathogens. And uh, well, since uh, yes, for of some of these pathogens, no uh, sequence data is available or very limited is available, uh, the development of these assays is quite hard. So how do we uh, conduct 
uh, process to actually in the end design such an assay uh, which is specific for the pathogen. So of course you grow your bacteria, if I use bacteria again as an example, and do DNA isolation. After the DNA isolation, you're checking the quality of the isolated DNA because you need quite a high uh, concentration and uh, without a residual DNA uh, fragments or chemicals in there. Then uh, you conduct the nanopore sequencing of the DNA. And with uh, that, you start the sequencing and do base calling of the data. Well, this base calling of the data, uh, after that, you go through a pipeline of the, to, to make this uh, data more polished. So you go through the assembling and polishing uh, pipeline, then a comparative analysis is done, and then you get the visualization of regions of interest uh, that are specific for this pathogen compared to all known sequences uh, of uh, this pathogen or related pathogens. And uh, then in the end, uh, yeah, these assays roll out of the pipeline. We can order them and check on our isolate collections if this is specific or something. So here you have a comparative, uh, an example of comparative uh, analysis. So in yellow, we use uh, a reference genome, which is currently present in GenBank. And we you see here in blue, uh, the assembly of the reads that we uh, generate. And the differences that you can see here, and I will, I will touch it just shortly, is that uh, sometimes uh, the sequence information on GenBank is uh, yeah, bigger than what we find for our, uh, for our assembly. And also all these darker bars that you can see uh, here is that the deviation uh, between the one that we reference to. Uh, this can mean that the reference isolate is completely different and wrongly called in NCBI, which is highly possible since uh, early uh, sequences are uploaded there and uh, yeah, there were no references back then. On the other hand, uh, what you also can see is that we ge generate, of course, more uh, sequence data. Uh, so our genome is bigger than uh, one uh, that is the reference. But uh, the reference is 100% alike. That's what you see with XCV. Uh, and this is simply because uh, yeah, some uh, regions are missed. And uh, yeah, second generation sequencing were, was used. So these repeated uh, regions are uh, missing some of the repeats. Or uh, GC rich regions are missed. So the, the, the actual genome is not far, it's far from comp complete. But, uh, to go further and uh, demonstrate uh, an example of uh, what we did with actually a bacteria, which is a tomato bacteria and uh, a pathogen actually, and a pepper pathogen, and uh, is not an ISTA method, but it's just an example of one of the things that we're doing, is Xanthomonas gardneri. So what did we uh, do? Well, we uh, generated uh, the sequence data, uh, create uh, uh, our assembly uh, a genome from our isolate. Then uh, the pipeline took all the uh, 1334 Xanthomonas genomes present in NCBI at the time. Then uh, of these, there were 13 Xanthomonas Gardneri uh, genomes present. And the alignment was, uh, was done with all these genomes in search for a specific region. Well, there were 18 uh, unique regions identified. And uh, these unique uh, regions, uh, there were uh, interesting uh, genes, uh, mostly uh, doing something with pathogenicity or, uh, of, of the bacteria. And from these uh, nine uh, genes, uh, we generated 12 assays, and it's then uh, checking what, what is the best assay actually of these 12 to use. Okay, that's it on uh, the, uh, the second uh, uh, 
uh, what is it, second use of, uh, uh, of next generation sequencing for uh, pathogen detection on seed. And now uh, I come to the end actually, and that's uh, the conclusions and the thoughts. So, uh, well, we talked about quantitative molecular screening. Well, advantages are uh, that uh, the decreases uh, the seed health test uh, time itself uh, by not having to conduct uh, electro, electro uh, gel electrophoresis or by directly screening of seeds, which uh, might prevent uh, dilution plating. Um, well, uh, on dilution plate, during dilution plating, uh, other uh, bacteria or, or fungi growing uh, or present on the seeds can uh, interfere with the scoring of, uh, of the plates. So, and this is prevented by, uh, by using uh, quantitative molecular screening. And uh, no knowledge, uh, specific uh, morphology knowledge is, uh, is needed when uh, testing uh, fungi. Disadvantages are also present, of course. Uh, well, direct molecular testing only demonstrates the presence of the DNA or the RNA of the path pathogen. And uh, yeah, it doesn't say that uh, uh, the DNA is present of a live cell or from dead cells. Uh, yeah, the incidence of the infection is not known when uh, testing large pools. Uh, well, individual seeds for fungi testing, uh, individual seeds are tested. Oh, well, it gives an indication on viability of the pathogen, but uh, that is not, well, if it doesn't give an in that, uh, identification indication on the viability of the pathogen. So a pathogenicity test also always needs to be conducted to prove uh, if, if the pathogen, when present, is pathogenic, yes or no. And there's, all, uh, there's a constant discussion going on on the biological relevance of quantitative data. And then for sequencing, uh, another option uh, for future screening uh, of the, uh, as an option for uh, future screening is uh, the advantages are uh, the determination is going far much more sensitive into subspecies of cultivar levels. Uh, that's especially for, uh, for fungi testing uh, very important, I would say, uh, since one, uh, can be, one family member can be pathogenic and the other not, but deviation uh, by morphological uh, screening is uh, is hard. And uh, it's uh, you can use it as a one test to identify all organisms present in the seed instead of performing multiple tests. A disadvantage is, uh, is that uh, the cost price of sequencing is uh, quite high, and you also need uh, well uh, skilled personnel in the lab to perform these, uh, this uh, sequencing, but the prices are decreasing rapidly actually. And uh, well, you need, uh, as I said, specialists to conduct the test, but more important actually, you need uh, bioinformatic uh, people to uh, do uh, design the pipelines and, uh, and analyze the data that come out of the, uh, out of the sequence runs. Uh, it's based on DNA and RNA. So uh, pathogenicity in this case also still needs to be determined. Uh, that was uh, my uh, last uh, slide. Thank you for your attention and uh, looking forward to some questions later on. Thank, thank you, Ruth, for your presentation. Um, we will take a few questions later. I've got one here. If you are putting in questions, please um, uh, try to Put also the name for the person who you want um, this question to be answered. Uh, in the moment it is quite clear because we only have one presentation. Now I hand over to Geoffrey Auger. He is uh, working at, um, at GVS. Um, uh, he studied partially also at the University of Angers and has a master on plant pathology and Pathology. I hope that is all correct, Jeffrey, and your yes, title is, is up on the screen, and um, the screen is yours for the next 20 minutes, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, okay. So, is it good? Uh, everybody can see my screen? Yes. Perfect. 
So, uh, thank you for this uh, introduction, uh, Andreas. Um, uh, I here to present you the importance uh, to know uh, uh, the presence of the pest uh, in CDF's test, but uh, uh, also uh, if the, the pests uh, are alive and pathogenic. This is the most uh, important question, question for us. And my presentation is focused on that. So, just to introduce um, uh, some uh, information, we have an intensifying uh, movement of seeds uh, between the country due to a lot of exchange, uh, and especially for the production, international trade, import, export, but also uh, uh, the research um, project and breeding activities. So phytosanitary issues are different between the country uh, and, and due to diverse import requirements and also um, different diagnostic and inspection methodologies. So CDS test for fire and requirement also. So for the need for the seeds, so we, we need to know uh, if um, they are healthy, but if they are complying to importing countries regulation. So knowing the issue, uh, we have an important increase in diversity of seed treatment. So the, the chemical uh, treatment, but also the uh, alternative treatment, for example, uh, biocontrol or uh, physical disinfection. And we have also a, a lot of diversity of analysis and we need to release uh, more quickly uh, seed lots uh, due to the uh, intensity of the market. So we need to know if the seed uh, is a real vector, uh, if the pest still alive and pathogenic and causing damage for, to the crops. So how um, detection, classical detection tests need to be adapted and, and we developed a complementary test to measure uh, viabil viability and pathogenicity of, uh, of the pathogen. So currently our detection method requires a series of steps to ensure that uh, the pathogen is, uh, is present, is detected. So we extract the microorganism from the seeds in order to isolate it. Uh, and, and in the aim to detect it, of course, and, and uh, to identify it. We use for that uh, morphological criteria most of the time, and we can also uh, have some uh, step of confirmation for the pathogenicity and also measure the viability. And we will see just after that uh, all the methods are not um, contain all the steps. So in this slide, we have a, an overview of the uh, general method used in seed health tests. So we have the planting of seeds, uh, seed wash, extraction embryos, lesion planting and PCR grow out, uh, local lesion assay, ELISA, and seed extract PCR. And we have also the main step um, that we are looking for during um, our process. So the extraction of the, micro the capacity of the method to extract the microorganism from, from the seeds or the matrix. Um, isolation also, identification, uh, but also in information about pathogenicity and viability. And that we can see <clears throat> is um, for seed wash method, for example, or extraction embryos. We, the method uh, doesn't allow to, to have information about the pathogenicity and viability of the pathogens. Uh, most of the time, these methods are based on the um, direct observation of the pathogens and the results are qualitative, so it's presence of absence of the pathogen, but no information about the pathogenicity. Uh, it's also the case for ELISA and seed extract PCR. But we can see that some of the methods, like grow out, uh, the grow out protocol, uh, can inform about uh, all this um, uh, precision, all these modalities, and, and uh, uh, give the possibility to, to to have um, information about pathogenicity and variability. And it's also the case for the, the process, I mean, the protocol using deletion plating and PCR, for example. So we, we know that there are a lot of uh, diversity of detection methods, especially uh, on fungi, bacteria, viruses, uh, nematodes and hafids, and also on a lot of different species. So we work on it uh, in order to, to adapt it uh, and to, to be uh, in coherence with the seed market. So um, for the R&D project, uh, the different R&D project, we developed, adapt and validate uh, detection methods. 
based on the other principle like growth and PCR, but also uh, new tools to evaluate the viability of the pathogen. And we will see some examples just after. So the first of them uh, concerns the uh, common band, Tilesia caries. Uh, so um, the current detection method uh, using a seed wash, uh, filtration and microscope observation of the spores. But um, like I said, uh, we have no information. There is no proof of uh, the viability of the spores. So we developed a PCR detection method in order to confirm uh, the, the presence of the pathogen in uh, in the plant, so we we developed a um, sorry we, we developed a, a growth and PCR method in order to detect the presence of the pathogen in um, early de detection uh, on plants. So we grow in seedling, we use growing seedlings, uh, and we detect the the, the pathogen in a, in a small part of the plant after a gene extraction. So this test was um, promoted to to, to was carrier to promote expression of symptoms uh, in, in, a, in a field, sorry. So um, here you have some uh, the main steps of the protocol. We can see that we are uh, using uh, uh, seeds artificially infected by, um, by spores uh, grounded from burn balls. And then the, the seeds are sowing in a controlled condition uh, under a favorable uh, condition uh, in order to, to to uh, facilitate the transmission of the pathogen from seed to plant. So the seedlings are growing until the three, two, three leaf stages, and um, and uh, we sampling uh, close to the stem in order to to do the DNA extraction and a qPCR. So in um, histogram uh, on the left. Uh, uh, part of the of the slide, we can see the most important results that we obtained during the test app project. The method was carried out in order to evaluate the capacity of transmission uh, of the pathogen from seed to plants, and we compared um, uh, the symptom expression obtained in field and in greenhouse compared to uh, infected plantlet detected by PCR. And we can see that uh, with these tools, we, we uh, obtain a very interesting correlation between uh, the both uh, observations. And this uh, protocol was adapted after to evaluate resistance of the varieties during the ABLE project, but also during the ACID project uh, in order to screen alternative seed treatment uh, against uh, Tilesia caries. We also try to <clears throat> to develop this kind of protocol for other uh, pathogens like Estilago uh, nudan bar. Another example concern uh, Acidobrax citrilli. Uh, so here we have a comparison between a growth protocols and uh, an, another method using the seed extract protocol. So we can see that uh, in a greenhouse gray protocol we uh, need to have a, a long period of test, so between 14 and 21 days in Sweetbox, in order to, to have the first um, uh, symptom expression at cotyledon stage. And in case of suspect cotyledon, we uh, are confirmed the, the presence of the pathogen by uh, QPCR or by biotest. So uh, this method um, has the, the advantage to, to inform about uh, aggressiveness and viability of the pathogen. But it's time-consuming, and, and if we want a final result, we need to wait uh, 14 between 14 and, and 24 days. So um, a pre-screening step uh, was added. Uh, a seed extract PCR uh, pre-screening method um, was added in, in before uh, test uh, the seed lot in growth, and um, the, this method was validated uh, uh, by evaluation of the performance criteria. And like told uh, Wood uh, just previously, we, we know that this method is very really sensitive. So we can see when the uh, PCR extracts are negative that the seed lots are healthy. But in case of positive result, we need to know if uh, the pathogen is still alive uh, and in capacity to, to cause damage. So we uh, need to confirm the, the presence of the pathogen by a, a growth test. Uh, and, um, and this uh, workflow is um, more, more step, more time consuming uh, when we have a, a positive sample. So it, it takes more time to have a, a final result and it could be more expensive. But 
um, this allowed to, to, to release quicker the hit distillates in case of uh, negative results during the pre-screening test. Another example uh, concerning Tobamo viruses detection. So here we have a, uh, we're using an ELISA uh, method on gradient seeds. And we can see that uh, in case of uh, infectious viruses or non-infectious viruses present uh, for the Tobamo viruses due to the high stability uh, of the virus, we can have a, a positive result. Uh, but in this case, we need to confirm uh, that um, infectious uh, viruses uh, using a biotest developed by ISTA. And this biotest concerns an indexing of uh, grain and seed on tobacco resistance to tobacco viruses. And, and we observe the, the presence or the absence of uh, local lesions. So in case of presence of local lesions, sorry, we can confirm that the, that the virus is infectious. And in case of uh, no local lesion, we, we have non-infectious viruses. So in this case, we can also add it a seed extract PCR pre-screening step, uh, but ILISA uh, has already used uh, uh, like that. But uh, we need to confirm uh, the positive results by an indexing step. And this step is uh, obligate, an obligate confirmation to control the infections of the viruses. Two last examples, um, like I told in the beginning, the, um, some methods are based on the direct observation of the, of the pathogens. So um, most of the time after a seed wash or, or, um, or other. And, um, and we, we developed, we, we, yes, we developed, uh, we had it, uh, some complementary steps uh, from, uh, from this protocol in order to have information about the viability of the pathogen. So for the first example, we developed a protocol to, uh, for a um, still increased deep uh, so based on a staining method. Uh, in this case, the stain uh, is fixed on the dead tissues, and this allowed to um, uh, observe the, uh, the, the red, uh, red nematodes on the microscopes. Uh, so this test is done on isolated nematodes, and it can confirm if, if the, the pathogen, the yes, the nematode is alive or dead. So in based on the same principle, we we also have a staining method uh, for the evaluate the viability of the spores on Tilesia caries. This also a step additional to the uh, to the protocol, so it was integrated into the protocol. Uh, and the staining method allowed to have um, uh, presence of uh, also red spores, but in this case, it's um, a, uh, the, the stain is fixed on the viable tissue. So, um, so compared to the germination method, we can obtain results in 40 high towers, uh, and uh, it's less time-consuming to, to to read the to read on the microscope because it's. Uh, easier to check the presence of red spots. Uh, compared to the germination protocol, uh, the germination protocol need to, to wait uh, almost 15 days uh, in order to observe spores germinate. And, and um, we doesn't use um, uh, specific media, so we have a lot of um, microorganism growth in the plate, so it's very difficult to, to check the presence of the spore and to, to see the presence of the germination. So to conclude, we, we have seen uh, that uh, modern molecular techniques existing uh, in, micro, in microbiological and plant pathology techniques. So these tools are uh, in, in complement, in addition for optimizing CDELS methods, and it's allowed to increase the uh, overall specificity of the method, but also uh, the throughput of, of the laboratory. And uh, it enables faster screening of ACC lots. But, um, but we can see, uh, and like explain uh, just uh, before our route, that uh, it's really important to have the information of the viability of the pathogen and information of the capacity of transmissibility of the pathogen. So it's essential to meet the need of the seed market. So that's why we, we continue to work on the, on the different techniques uh, uh, based on the growth and PCR protocol, but also added confirming essay using uh, for example, using indexing or pathogenicity tests and also staining methods. So all these tools uh, are available and are developed <clears throat> in order to, 
to have this answer about the viability and transmissibility of the patent. So thanks for the attention. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. That was a very nice presentation. Um, we clear questions which might come up later in the discussion. Um, we are changing now a little bit to alternative um, control measures. And I would like to invite uh, Valerie Grimaud. She's head of phytopathology laboratory at Jeves in France. Um, she's also head of the ISA Seat Health Committee. And she made her PhD at the uh, University Paris Sud and phytopathology. Valerie, I hope that is all correct, what my information says, tell me, and um, I would like to hand over to you, and um, you will tell us something on genetic resistance. Thank you very much. Do you see my, uh, my screen? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay. So genetic resistance. Okay, it's blocked and I cannot... Uh... Yes. So um, we have, um, against pests, we have different control measures and uh, one of them is to secure the movement of seeds with uh, healthy seeds and we talked about it uh, in the two previous uh, presentations. One is prophylaxis when we are in the field, in the growing area. We can have chemical control, alternative control like biocontrol, for example, and, uh, and one is the genetic resistance. So that's what I'm going to focus my, my talk today about. Um, well, the, the genetic resistance concept started with the gene for gene concept of floor. So it was years, years, years ago. And uh, in the years 1950s, research institutes and also seed companies started to, to create plant material which was resistant to pathogen and to insects that I will call pest for the rest of my presentation. And we can see that uh, some uh, resistant varieties were present already in the years 1930, 1937 for potato, pepper, and lettuce, mainly for viruses at the beginning. So for resistance, one thing which is important is that we need to speak the same language. And sometimes when we are talking to other people, we see that we have slightly differences in our language. So just uh, to try to speak the same language, we, we set up a group uh, with ISF, which is called the Disease Resistance Terminology Working Group, uh, ISF DRT, where we gave some definitions about susceptibility, high resistance, and intermediate resistance. Just, just to be sure that we know exactly the same things. So susceptibility we called as the inability for the plant to restrict the growth or the development of the pest. While resistance is the ability to restrict this growth and development and reduce also the damages compared to susceptible varieties. It's always a comparison. And in resistance, we defined two levels, one which is high resistance. So it means that it's high, a high restriction of the growth and development. And intermediate resistance, where still the, where in the varieties, the growth of the pest is restricted but a little less than in the high resistant, and it could show some symptoms and some damages compared to high resistant variety, but always much less severe symptoms or damage than susceptible ones.
So these terms are now used in seed companies catalogs and also for the US studies uh, in Europe and in CPVO protocols. So that also the term speaks about the same language. Uh, and we also see another term which is tolerance and this tolerance we use it more for abiotic stresses uh, in the ISF uh, working group. But you will see that some vi virologists call tolerance something where there is a multiplication of the virus but no symptoms and um, no yield decrease. That's uh, a term which is not used uh, for us. Uh, for us, tolerance is tr really uh, for abiotic stresses. Um, in the ISFDRT, we also did uh, a list and uh, a coding uh, system for the best, just to avoid uh, misunderstanding. Because uh, in my career, uh, one day I, I, I gave an, a result and uh, I had uh, the customer or the seed company saying, oh, no, no, but you said it was resistant, but for me, it's susceptible to this race. And talking and talking and talking together, we noticed that we were not speaking about the same thing. I was speaking about fall one, but for Europe, and they were speaking about fall zero because in the US and you, uh, fall zero was not existing and they were starting at fall one. That's why for avoiding misunderstanding in ISFDRT, we now really describe what is what. Fall zero in Europe is corresponding to fall one in US. So we hope that there will be less mistakes. Uh, we also did some tables of differentials. Uh, at the beginning, the table of differentials were just from the bibliography. It was to, to know what are the differentials we can, which can um, allow to identify the races of the pests. And uh, after we moved to something which was more based on the experience of the seed industry, and now we are really validating these tables of differentials with multi-laboratory tests. So we face different types of resistance. The more known one and the more uh, no, what we have more is the monogenic resistance. And generally it's a high level of resistance. But we, que we can question the durability of this resistance. It's always something which comes. Um, and due to the resistance mechanisms, this sort of resistance can be overcome and some isolates break the resistance and then we have new races or new pathotypes. Some of these monogenic resistance are very stable. One which was well known is the air gene for Coletotricum on Dean, which was found in the nine, 1960s and uh, is still very efficient, even if there are some isolates which are breaking, but they seem to have a less good fitness. And this one was uh, my uh, case study that I was giving to students to say, oh, it's a very, very stable resistance gene, TM22 gene for resistance to TMV, very resist stable gene. Yeah, well, until uh, we had um, TOBRV uh, emerging and TOBRV, which is a new virus, emerging, em an emerging virus, which is breaking this resistance. So not a, a so stable uh, gene anymore. And we have also some monogenic resistance and with pests which are evolving very fast. And the best example is the Bremia on lettuce. Uh, and to monitor the evolution of this, um, of this fungi, uh, we, Uh, to monitor the, this evolution, uh, we have uh, an international group uh, which is called IBEB in Europe and there's also one in the US where we are doing some epidemiological survey. For example, uh, in the last uh, four months in 1921, more than 100 isolates have been characterized 
and it allows to see the evolution of the isolates and to, and to know if we have to define new races. So we have criteria which are very strict for nomination of new races. And we have codes for differentials and sex state codes like that you see here for the races. And now you see that it evolves very fast because we are up to BL36 Europe uh, for Bremia at the moment. And another type of resistance is uh, oligo or polygenic resistance, which is uh, um, governed by several genes. Uh, generally, it's more giving an intermediate resistance. It's not isolate specific and it's supposed known to be more durable. Uh, some examples are here for fusarium on uh, wheat, uh, fusarium headlight, where you can see a scale of notation with very uh, resistant varieties and very um, susceptible ones, for example, and also for powdery mildew uh, on melon, where you had dif different scales of notation and at the left, very resistant and at the right, very susceptible. Uh, sometimes this uh, oligogenic resistance are combined or associated with high resistance. And uh, really uh, what we see is that they are more and more used and uh, they are increasing in number. So resistance tests, they are used um, at different stages of, uh, of the, the seed chain. First, they are very used for, uh, to screen for genetic resources. They are used also during breeding and at the end after breeding for registration and protection of varieties just before they go to the market. The principle is always the same. It's a comparison of a variety uh, to resistant and susceptible controls and sometimes to intermediate resistant uh, controls. And the protocols need to be just reproducible, practical, and also representative of the real resistance. So here you have some examples of the, of the tests that can be carried out, either in growth chamber or in the field. And the condition to test are in growth chamber, in greenhouses, in the field, uh, and this sort of test is very min miniaturized, uh, and it goes from the more miniaturist to the last one, to the more controlled test to the less one, but and to the quicker to the longer one. I really prefer to do a resistance test in growth chamber, but sometimes the resistance is really expressed only in field test and not in growth chamber. So the choice of where and how to do the test will really depend on the path system. So the requirements for resistance test is to have some controls, resistance, susceptible, intermediate resistance, which are validated, available also, and healthy, so that they don't transmit something we don't want. Differentials, just to be able to identify what race we have. Reference isolates, also validated, available, stable, and also representative of natural conditions. Just to give you an example, here in, in GVS, we have around 250 tests uh, in our collection that are reference ones. We need to have protocols, notation scales, and interpretation that are repeatable and reproducible. And uh, in France, we, to, to have this uh, material, we, we set up a few years ago a MATREF network, MATREF for reference material. Uh, it gives um, um, some reference material. Uh, at the moment, it's for 11 spaces. So you see that we have a lot of uh, host pest combinations and uh, it, uh, it makes the, the reference material available for people who need it. The steps of resistance tests are always more or less the same. It's a sowing of the variety and the controls, a production of inoculum. When we are uh, lucky, it's cultivable, 
uh, and that we can grow the inoculum in petri dishes. And when we are less lucky, they are biotrophic uh, pests, and we need to maintain them just on the host plant. The inoculation is going to mimic the natural conditions of inoculation. So here they are on this picture at the left, they are cutting the grass like uh, when the, the grass is cut uh, in, uh, in fields, for example. Incubation to allow the disease to, to occur and there it's favorable conditions of uh, humidity, temperature and light. And the notation, when it's high resistance, it's a present or absence. And when it's an intermediate resistance, it's based on an intensity of symptoms. And really, uh, resistance testing is an increase in activities in all our laboratories because there are more breeding for resistance in seed companies. More resistance, which are included in uh, the US or uh, VCU characteristics for registration and protection of varieties. Also, the pests are evolving, so we have more races to test and we have to adapt our tests to the evolution of the pest. And of course, we have new pests, like for example, this year, we had TOBRV and we had to deal with it. Just to give you an example, uh, in the UPOV uh, guidelines, there are more than 300 crops. Among them, uh, 15 crops need to have resistance tests. It's around 144 resistance tests which are performed. 20 are compulsory and more than 100 are not compulsory, but still carried out. Uh, that's just to show you how it evolved uh, in GVS, for example, from the years 1993, very few resistance tests up to now, really to, to answer to the needs of the, the seed sector. Each time there is something red, it's because it's a new pest or a new combination. And now we are up to 146 host trace pest combination which are tested. So really an increasing need to test uh, for resistance and to have resistant varieties. And with this increasing need, there is also an increasing need of harmonization. Because when we test in one location, the results should be the same in every location to be sure that we, we don't say, oh, this variety is susceptible in one lab and is resistant in another one. So for that, we did some research projects uh, at the European level. Uh, they were called ARMOS. So we had the first one and the second one. And I'm good, just going to give you some details about the third one, where we harmonized the seven protocols for uh, vegetable species. Uh, here you have them, one was uh, for nematodes, some were from fungi, and uh, in this uh, project we um, focused more on intermediate resistance. And together, for example, that you see at the top of this slide, we, um, we set up some rules of decisions based on controls, Kazakh Rouge, which is susceptible, Campeon and Tionic, which are intermediate resistance, and Ayup by Kazakh Rouge, which are resistant. And based on that and statistical analysis, we are able to see, to say if the variety is judged susceptible, intermediate resistant or resistant. And everybody agreed on these uh, scales and everybody is going to use these scales just to have everywhere the same results. We also have some ISF uh, disease resistance terminology uh, group projects to harmonize also on powdery mildew on melon, on fulvia fulva on tomato, and on fusarium on lettuce. There are some projects also at the IBEB uh, level to harmonize as a way of, for example, testing for bremia in case of uh, slower resistance, intermediate resistance. And also at the Euroseed HRT uh, level for some of the pests. So all these initiatives and all these projects have really a goal for harmonization and speaking the same language and doing the interpretation in the same way. 
and also to, to follow on the harmonization, we, uh, we set up a project at the European level, which is called the Armoresco, because in the former uh, Armores project, we had harmonized the protocols and uh, given some reference material, but uh, we needed to make it available for people. And uh, we said, okay, we want to have an harmonized collection for reference material for the US resistance test um, uh, at a broad level. So it's a project which is co-funded by CPVO with, uh, and which is coordinated by Cheves, man managed by Cheves and Nactambo, with also CREA and INIA as examination offices and many, many seed companies. So the project is to have a collaborative uh, platform. And when people will ask, okay, what reference material do I need? How can I access it? We will have an harmonized pro portal to provide information on the reference material and to, be, to allow people to obtain this reference material. So in this project, first you, you, we make an inventory and an availability of uh, the material. Uh, we will validate it and the collections and uh, initiatives will be coordinated to be able to provide reference material to people who need it. I just wanted to give you a, an example of uh, alternative control with resistance. It's for Tilesia on, uh, on wheat. Uh, Tilesia is a re-emerging uh, disease in organic uh, farming. Well, you can see at the right the symptoms it, they do. Uh, it's uh, important for breeding for resistance in this case when you have no seed treatment. And in the project, we said, we said, okay, what are the species and races which are present? So we had some epidemiological studies, also very, very important to know what was present. So it was more Tilesia caries in France. We did defined what virulences of the isolates were more present. And we selected one reference isolate, which was representative of what occurred in, in the fields, really. Uh, the problem of the field test was that it was very time consuming and there were risk of cross contaminations. So we set up a laboratory test on plantlets by PCR detection, a little based on what uh, Geoffrey presented you. It's a grow out on plantlets and after a PCR test on the plantlets, and it's completely correlated with the level of resistance in the field. So it allows to have a very fast result in a few weeks, instead of waiting for the adult plant of the, of the plant in the field. And now it's something which is used for variety registration in France, but also for seed companies and some organization who want to know the resistance of their uh, varieties. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Valerie, for that um, informative section here. Um, we continue with our last presenter of today and of the whole um, seminar. It will be Marie Simonin. I hope I pronounced that name good. Uh, she's working at the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment, INRA. A. I have to add the A recently. I don't know how long it is. I'm, I'm pretty old in that business and um, for me it was always INRA and now you added an A for environment, I think, um, at the end. And um, uh, Marie, the floor is yours for your nice presentation. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about the Succeed project for stopping the use of pesticides in seeds using plant and microbiome-based solutions. And so this is a project that is part of a huge uh, research program in France funded by the French government to, with the ambitious goal of uh, stop using synthetic pesticides in agriculture in France by 2040. 
And so our project is uh, focused on seeds. And this project is uh, coordinated by Mathieu Barry, which is my colleague at INRAE. So just to give you an overview of this project, this is a, we are a very large consorti consortium of academic partners with 11 different academic partners. But we have also uh, in this project, uh, seed producer associations, um, fertilizer uh, produ uh, uh, companies, biocontrol companies, uh, the GVS, our colleagues from across the street, and also uh, some companies from the private sector, um, small companies and startups. And so this project is just starting and uh, is, will be going on for six years. And you can follow the project on Twitter uh, with this account. So just some brief context. So right now we're trying to secure seed quality mainly through different seed treatment. There is a, a huge market uh, for seed treatment. And as you can see on these graphs for different crops, we mainly rely on fungicide and insecticide as seed treatments. And uh, as you know, uh, there are many fungicides that are currently uh, authorized, but we know that in the coming years or decades, they will be banned. So we'll really need to uh, start having uh, new solutions to secure seed quality. And so there are different alternative solutions to pesticides, such as chemical solutions, for instance, using copper sulfate, physical uh, solutions like thermotherapy, UVC, or biological uh, biocontrol or biostimulation. But these different approaches, they all have their own issues, uh, such as phytotoxicity for copper and potential environmental impacts. Uh, physical approaches are good for surface, seed surface only. And for biological solutions, we know that there are some variations in effectiveness. So we're, we're really trying here in the SUCCEED project to, to contribute new innovative solutions that are adapted to seed protection. And our objectives are twice, so two main objectives in this project, securing seed health to avoid plant disease emergence, to produce healthy seeds. And uh, as you've seen in previous talks, so seed is uh, trading material that can be a carrier of different plant pathogens. And in this project, we will be working on four main crops, so rapeseed, tomato, wheat, and bean. And as you can see here, the, those different seeds are well-known carrier of different pathogens, uh, bacteria and fungi especially. And so there are good models for this project to, uh, to try these new innovations that we will propose. So this is one objective, uh, producing healthy seeds. The second one is to reduce the impacts of damping off. And so as you know, damping off is it's due to seed-borne or soil-borne pathogens and can have a huge impact on crop establishment and yield from five to 80% loss. And so here we will uh, try to propose different bio-inspired solutions to limit the impacts of damping off. And so our approach is to really use the seed itself as the source of the innovation. So we can call that bio-inspiration and uh, Basically, we're going to uh, see uh, what is naturally produced or associated to the seed, like small RNA, peptides, metabolites, and microorganisms uh, to be used to reduce damping off and reduce also the prevalence of pathogens in seeds. And uh, we will uh, propose solutions that are directly applied on seeds uh, because we know that if we apply the solution on the seed directly, uh, we will use uh, 150 times less active ingredient than if we spread it to the field. So it's also a more sustainable and environmentally friendly solution. And the, our approach is proposing that seed is really a, a keystone of modern agriculture with an all-in-one solution. Um, and we will have different, uh, we have different work packages that are covering uh, different steps from production of healthy seeds to post-harvest processes, conditioning, field trials, but also this project is not only uh, with uh, microbiologists, pathologists, and uh, plant physiologists, but also we have jurists, economists, uh, people from the social science to also uh, look into the regulatory and economic and social issues related to seeds and how we can actually make these solutions acceptable um, and also uh, marketable. And so the, the main solutions, uh, the main uh, innovations that we will be proposing are related to three 
main uh, approaches. So the first one is to enhance uh, the seed defenses, natural defenses, and ex uh, unravel the, the seed defense mechanisms that uh, exist during seed maturation, focusing on epigenetic uh, mechanisms and uh, so focusing on small RNAs and micropeptides. A second approach is uh, related to seed microbiome engineering. So see how seed microbiome can influence seed vigor positively and uh, influence negatively plant pathogens, so using synthetic microbiota. And uh, the last approach is to use the seed local environment, so to, to see how seed exudates uh, can uh, be important for seed susceptibility to pathogens and interactions uh, with the microbiome. So using uh, proteomics and metabolomics to characterize uh, seed exudates and their role in the uh, development of pathogens. And so basically we are building uh, a new research field uh, related to seed microbiome interactions. And so uh, we will, from these different work packages, we will identify different solutions and we will propose also different uh, seed formulation to be able to use those uh, and market these uh, solutions. And so we have different uh, chemists in the project uh, that will try different uh, approaches to promote molecular stability and bioavailability of these solutions using classical seed formulation or novel approaches like emulsion and nano encapsulation. And so uh, today I, I'm not going to develop all these different work package, but I'm going to focus on the seed microbiome engineering uh, approach because I'm the uh, work package leader and uh, I will not be really able to tell you much more about work package two and four, <laughs> but you can always ask questions. So, I'm going to give you some information on why we think focusing on seed microbiota is uh, a good way uh, to promote seed health. And so first, a quick uh, introduction on plant microbiota. You can see on this graph that um, the microbiome uh, of the plant is really everywhere. It's in the roots, it's in the, the soil, it's in the stem, the leaves, the fruits, and of course the seed. We can also call it the sp spermosphere. And the microbes that are naturally associated to plants are from bacteria, archaea, fungi, omycetes, viruses, protists, and so on. So really a very large diversity of microorganisms. But right now in the literature, if you look at all the publications on plant microbiota, you can see that most of the papers are coming on roots or the rhizosphere or on leaves or the phytosphere. But seeds are really understudied. It's Seeds are really an understudied compartment of the phytobiome. And uh, right now, the potential of seed microbiota is really underexploited in agriculture, as we often rely on actually sterilization uh, of the seeds. But by sterilizing seeds, we can ask ourselves, do we non-intentionally impact plant fitness and productivity? Because those, the seed microbiota represent the primary inoculum of plants. This is the beginning of the assembly of the, the adult plant microbiota. So if you think about what happens in humans, and we, we know much more than on the microbiome of humans than plants, you know, if you sterilize a baby, or if you use antibiotic treatment on a baby, we know that this will have huge impacts on the assembly of its gut microbiome, can cause allergy, autisms, and many other problems. So by doing the same thing on plants, are we actually impacting long-term fitness and productivity of the plants? I think this is a very important question to address. Moreover, um, as we've said before, seeds are really an ideal uh, vector uh, matrix to apply new biocontrol and biostimulants to solutions because it's directly on the plants and you don't need to spread an entire field. And so the plant microbiome is really emerging as uh, an important player of plant health and fitness. We know of many, many examples that this plant microbiome represents an extended plant phenotype, meaning that the plant to survive in an environment doesn't rely only on its genes, but also on all the genes and genomes of all the microbes around them. And we have many evidences that this microbiome can play a role in water and nutrient acquisition, phenotypic plasticity, 
tolerance to abiotic stressors and also provide what we call an extended immunity to uh, stressors, biotic stressors such as, uh, of course, pathogens. And if we look at these different beneficial impacts in the context of seed health and quality, uh, we know that microbes can impact germination timing and uniformity, uh, increase tolerance to variation in temperature, water, and nutrients, and also uh, counterattack uh, different seed-borne pathogen or reduce damping off and uh, the impact of herbivory. So in this context, we are proposing to uh, explore the, the, the effect of seed microbiome engineering to really uh, play uh, and modulate all these different traits. And so microbiome engineering, uh, I'm gonna give you some general concepts on how it works. Uh, we can do microbiome engineering at two main levels. We can uh, engineer the entire community. So really changing everything. And we have some evidence why it's a good idea actually. Um, we know that pathogen invasion success our disease outbreak are linked to microbiome diversity, meaning the more diverse the microbiome is, the less chance a pathogen will be able to colonize the plant. It can also be re related to a microbiome imbalance or called dysbiosis, meaning some microbes are not there or the structure is not normal and this will help or, uh, the pathogen come and colonize the, the host. And so this is called the diversity invasion relationship. And a second pr principle in ecology that we can use is uh, also related to microbial diversity. Promoting a high microbial diversity on a host uh, can lead to a diversity of function and a redundancy in those functions and a high resilience and resistance to different disturbances. And this is called the insurance hypothesis. The more diversity you have, the higher chance you will uh, have the beneficial function present or the higher chance you will have to maintain this function over time. So just to give you an example of the diversity invasion relationship, this is a graph showing the percentage of uh, wilted plants or diseased plants. Uh, when you have the pathogen that is uh, inoculated alone, you see that almost 90% uh, of the plants uh, have symptoms. But as you start adding more and more bacterial species uh, to the community, is here with five different species added in, uh, in addition to the pathogen, we see that there are only 25% of the plants that have symptoms. So this is just a, a, a simple example to show that manipulating the microbiome at the entire level and uh, promoting high diversity could be uh, positive to limit the impact of pathogens. The second level at which we can manipulate microbiomes is at the species level, the microbial species level, so by identifying microbes with superpowers. So a single microbe, a single species that can have a huge impact on uh, plant health. And so these taxa are called keystone taxa. By themselves, they can provide the resistance to a pathogen by occupying the niche, the space of the pathogen, or by providing key nutrients this is the most uh, common example, nitrogen fixators or mycorrhizal fungi or keystone taxa for plants. This, those keystone taxa can also promote a high diversity in the microbiome. So we just mentioned that earlier that that can be very positive. And these taxa are also called a facilitator or hub taxa. And they will promote uh, the presence of other microbes that are beneficial and the presence of uh, microbial functions. We can also uh, engineer the microbiome to uh, ensure that some core taxa are present. So the core microbiome uh, is constituted of species that are always there, systematically and consistently associated with the crop species. So we have a strong assumption that if the plants always allow those microbes to be there, potentially they are very important for their fitness and health, and that there is a strong coevolution between the, those microbes and that their absence could cause the microbial imbalance or dysbiosis and a higher susceptibility to uh, diseases. And so if we represent this uh, very simply, here you have a seed that has a microbiome, you put it in the soil, it's gonna encounter the soil microbiome. And over time, you're gonna have an assembly of this microbiome that is gonna structure itself, 
uh, starting with the seed microbes and the soil microbes. And you can have up taxa that are going to recruit other microbes and eventually recruit the core taxa and so on until you have a mature microbial assemblage. And what we can do and what we propose with seed microbiome engineering is to manipulate this initial inoculum, the primary inoculum of, of uh, seeds to really have a, a trajectory that would be beneficial over time for germination, emergence, and, and later on. Even if the initial microbes that we inoculate disappear over time, they could have beneficial impacts on the long term. And so in the SUCCEED project, what we propose is to do seed microbiome R&D using synthetic microbiomes. So we have seeds from the four crops that have been obtained for a great diversity of genotypes and production sites. And right now we are building a, a very large collection, culture-based collection of seed microbiota. So we are trying to isolate as many bacteria and fungi uh, from those seeds. And then we are doing molecular typing, meaning we are uh, identifying the taxonomy of those strains. And for selection of them, we are doing genome sequencing and metabolic fingerprinting. And by this way, we are creating a large microbial collection uh, for uh, building seed synthetic microbiomes. And so in the second step, we are designing synthetic communities or synthetic uh, microbiota, syncomes uh, of various diversity, composition, and so on. And we are inoculating those microbiomes on seeds and uh, using high throughput plant phenotyping, we are seeing which communities have positive or negative impacts on germination emergence. And also we uh, can do these experiments in presence of pathogens to see if they are able to limit the damping off or the transmission uh, of pathogen by seeds. And so with this approach, we are able to do a rapid screening of beneficial microbial communities. Uh, by an, identifying keystone and core taxa, uh, also uh, identifying optimal levels of microbial diversity and biomass, and identifying key microbial metabolites and functions to eventually uh, you know, uh, determine which community microbes or metabolites that could be used on seeds to uh, promote germination emergence and, re and resistance to pathogens. And so in conclusion, uh, we think that seed microbiome engineering is a promising view to replace pesticides and improve plant protection. It's cheap, it's natural based, it's sustainable, and it's quite low tech. And uh, we are also promoting other approaches from the other work packages uh, on priming seed defenses and using seed exudates as other uh, solutions. But there are still uh, many knowledge gaps that we will try to address in this project. Many crops are unstudied uh, right now. We, we don't have so many uh, data on seed microbiomes. And uh, we still need to identify who are the hub and core taxa with their key beneficial functions and uh, determine really under which conditions seed microbes can positively affect germination emergence and also their resistance to pathogens. And with this, I thank you for your attention and all my colleagues. Thank you for the invitation and I will be happy to respond to your question in the chat. Yeah, thank you very much as well from my side. Um, there is um, <laughs> there is one question about your email to, to get your email, but um, there we, we probably say you can contact her via the INRA website. That is uh, probably the best way to, to do so or you use social media uh, where you are present as well. Yeah. Um, maybe we can all come up to the, to the screen for the question and answer section. Um, can we start directly with you, Marie? Uh, the, the last one, I've got uh, uh, two questions here. Um, one is what happens when you increase uh, when you increase seed microbiome um, by inoculating with pathogens? When we inoculate uh, the seeds with both uh, synthetic microbiome and a pathogen? Yes. That's correct. 
um, so usually what there are two main outcomes <laughs> so one is the pathogen is taking over and uh, they are usually very competitive and um, then well you see that the damping off that the, the seeds are not germinating or the other way is that they're actually not able to to grow and uh, to colonize the, the seed because other microbes are already taking pla the place and the space or the, the niche. And so this is really what we're trying to do in this project. And we're actually uh, reconstruct reconstructing the metabolic networks of pathogens to really know what they eat, what they do, and find other microbes that are not pathogens that can occupy the same space. Okay. Thank you very much. There are more and more coming up now. Uh, we cannot take all in the time we have, but um, I try my best to, to find it, find the most interesting one to, to get. Uh, that is very time consuming here because it's not one question let's let's go and 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 uh, look for the the first questions coming in for for uh root um do you think in future we can have a gene bank yes. of pathogens dna rna to be used for seed health analysis, identification, and quantification. You got my question, Ruth? Well, for quantification, I'm not sure, but for... Uh, yes. Uh, So that's a yes for identification. Seems we're having a, some some trouble here. Yes. Um, but no for quantification. Okay. For well, Jeffrey, did you develop primers for what? Well, Ostilagon. Nuda PCR essay or published primers. Yeah, it was a question. Um, no, yeah. we 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 take uh, only a primer already published uh, in the literature, so we did not develop uh, personally uh, the primer. And another question, do you know what are the cost differences between the used GROW protocol today and from the new PCR protocol in seed health analysis? Do new PCR protocols are cheaper? Um, <clears throat> it depends on the pathosystem, system, but it concerns the uh, TSIA. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's more expensive due to the um, uh, or I can say that the, the uh, uh, DNA extraction port, uh, DNA extraction kit, and and um, and consumable uh, of uh, the PCR. So, but if uh, somebody has a precise question about price or something, it could be better to send me an email. I think. Okay. You are also found on on uh, or on the social media platforms. Um, for Valerie, a question: Seed storage fungi are they seed transmitted, or are they only saprophytic without transition to the next progeny? Well, in general, they are more um, just seed worn and uh, and saprophytic. But uh, if you really want to know more in detail, uh, I could uh, uh, suggest you uh, just to look uh, at the uh, 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 ISTA um, reference best list where we categorize 
the pest saying are they seed worn, seed transmitted and so on. And for vegetables, you also have the ISF regulated pest list that you can rely on to know this information. And another question for Marie. We're really getting a lot of questions in. Um, thanks for the very nice talk. Do you know how the soil microbiome, which can be very depending on the region where the seed is sown, can compete with the seed microbiome itself? Yeah, it's a very important question. And um, so when we will identify promising solutions, they will be tested on a great diversity of soils because we know that, um, of course, uh, every soil has different microbiomes. And so our solutions may not be efficient uh, everywhere. And this is the main problem with uh, biocontrol or biostimulation uh, solutions. So this is something that will be addressed in, the, in this project. And we are really aiming to find solutions that work in different soils, different plant genotypes, and even across plant species. Okay, there's another question to root. Uh, any study on micro uh, nanopore sequencing of viroids? I think root is a little bit. Connection problems. On some problems on connection. Good. Yeah, sorry, I have connection. No problem. Oh, he has a problem, but um, no problem. Um, there was one question from Ruth to Jeffrey. How can staining of nematodes for viability tell you about the time of death for nematodes? Does this help for trade of seed when the nematodes found are dead but present? um yes uh in fact we we um we have based our observation on the principle that if we find uh, mobile nematodes they are alive so um we don't uh, need to have a test to determine that but the problem was uh, on the, the immobile nematode in order to to know if they are sleeping or if uh, they are just uh, dead so that's why we we find this uh, this uh, staining method, uh, and um, and we are working on it uh, on the DTLS project. Uh, so the uh, protocols um, uh, developed during this project was uh, submit an official uh, became an official protocol a few months ago. Uh, so it was published, and, and we. Um, we work with the official services to to to, to take into account the uh, viability, the, the criteria of the viability uh, in this method. So uh, we hope that it will help in the future to to just um, maybe uh, uh, determine if the, the pathogen is um, problematic for the crops. So. Mm -hmm. I've got a general question which I would probably like to to answer here and maybe it can be answered also by valerie and steve in addition um vegetative propagation materials like tubers rhizomes cuttings um set slips um, are important planting materials for production of many crops that is true mostly for the area of um, uh, um, crops which are in the tropical area. Uh, they are also responsible for disease transmission, but health suspects as such propagating materials are not covered by ISTA. That is um, partly true. 
Uh, is it not worth extending the scope of ISTA Seed Health Committee to look into diseases of vegetable vegetative propagation material in the future? My answer to that is that we are looking uh, into the strategy of ISTA. We are looking into more uh, going into the area of tropical species and tropical seeds. In the past, um, we uh, had only species here, um, a tuber species, which were um, partly seed driven. Um, potatoes uh, were out of the scope when it came to tubers, but looking at um, more tropical species, we found that these type of other vegetative propagating materials might be something to be looked into uh, in the future of ISTA as well, but that is probably a strategic discussion which is um, opened now, but ongoing in the future and probably very interesting for the future of uh, the next um, executive committee of ISTA. Maybe Steve and Valerie, you can say a few words to that point as well. So oh, thank you, Andreas. I, I think you make a very good point that uh, ISTA, you know, ISTA was formed uh, to help with seed, seed testing and international trade. Uh, but now if there's a need to look at other areas, that could be looked at under the ISTA strategic plan, which, like you said, is up for review and will be consulted with membership and stakeholders in, in the coming period up, leading up to the 2022 meeting of ISTA where the new strategy would come into effect. So I think it's a chance for people to input and provide their ideas and, and needs for ISTA in the future. And that's something that Kashavulu Konosov as the new incoming ISTA president in 2022 and the newly elected ECOM in 2022 would be able to work with uh, reflecting the needs of the membership and the stakeholders. But maybe also, Valerie, you'd like to make a general comment from Seed Health's point yeah. of view? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, I'm very happy that you're raising new concerns and, uh, and new needs. And it's very important for, for us to know your needs. Because uh, the example I can give you is that uh, two years ago, we were in Hyderabad at the con ISTA Congress and uh, some people came to see the, the CDLs committee and came to see me and they said, oh, we really have a concern about uh, insects on seeds and we have no ISTA method. And to answer that, we worked with the Purity Committee and the ITC Committee to set up uh, a project which has been funded uh, by ISTA. And now we are exploring methods to detect insects in seeds. And this concern that you are saying about the vegetative uh, propagated material is something for me similar, where we could uh, take this idea and if it is in the strategy of ISTA, really work together in setting up research projects uh, to, to develop new methods. And do not forget that uh, you don't need to be part of the CDELS committee to propose methods. Uh, you also can submit methods to be validated and they are just reviewed and, and, they, and if they pass the review, they can become official methods. Any one of the other panelists who would like to comment on that point? No? In that case, I would close this question and answer session even if there are more questions coming up and um, growing up, which uh, tells us the need of um, uh, this type of information. Um, we have probably another um, go on seed health um, in the near future. And um, I hand over then for you to Valerie to um, close the meeting and afterwards for um, Dr. Shima and uh, Dr. Jones to um, take over and um, give uh, some closing remarks from um, Egypt and ISTA. Thank you, Andreas. Well, uh, I was really very happy to, to be able to give uh, you this, uh, 
this uh, seminar. I, I hope you enjoyed it. We wanted it to be just based on plant health, not only seed health. So that's why we chose several uh, presentations which were a little broader than just our seed health committee uh, activities uh, for you to really have an overview of what was important for us uh, in the health area, plant health area. And I was very happy of the, the success of the, of the meeting because uh, we, every day we had uh, more than 200 people uh, attending and connected. So uh, it's very nice to see that we did something which interested people. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it, um, all the different sessions. Uh, I just uh, wanted to thank the lecturers uh, over the three uh, different days. We had, for me, very, very good uh, lectures and, and really thank you for the lecturers for the time they, they spent uh, to prepare these lectures and to give us these lectures. Um, also, uh, thank you for the organizers and particularly for Andreas, who was our moderator. And uh, I just wanted to announce you two uh, different events. The 4th of June, the CEDELS committee will do his online um, open CEDELS committee meeting. So that's a, a meeting where we present uh, the projects that we have in CEDELS uh, committee at the moment. So all the method validation projects, the proficiency tests we are planning and also the trainings and workshops, seminars that we are planning. Uh, that's the 4th of June, and it will be announced uh, by ISTA. And uh, the CEDARS committee is also planning an online training, because you know that this year it's uh, quite impossible to travel and to give the workshops that we were used to give everywhere in, in the world. So we said, okay, people also need some training. So we are planning at the end of the year to provide you some um, trainings with uh, lectures, but also demonstrations and little quiz and, um, and polls so that uh, there can be some training on bacteria, nematode, and so on and so on techniques. So thank you very much uh, for, that, for attending and well, looking forward to, to seeing you again uh, in next uh, events. Thank you, Valerie. Dr. Shima. Thank you, Dr. Andrea. Uh, for me, I'm very pleased to have the chance to attend the three uh, sessions of Plant Health Seminar. Uh, it was very interesting, indeed. Uh, also, I'm pleased to present a few words on uh, behalf of Dr. Ahmad Adam, uh, the head of Central Administration for Seed Testing and Certification uh, in Egypt, uh, as follows. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I hope you are fine in this difficult time. Of course, we wish to see you all here in Egypt, but we hope this will be ended uh, very soon. Uh, on the occasion of the Plant Health Day, I would like to thank ISTA for organizing such an important seminar on plant health for its import, Im, impact on a uh, nation's food uh, chain. As, it we, uh, as, we, and as we all know uh, that protecting plant health can help to end hunger, boost economic development, and ensure a sufficient food supply and achieving sustainable and uh, profitable crop uh, production. Uh, also, I would like to thank all the presenters and speakers who are uh, participated uh, in this seminar, as, and it was a great chance uh, to share valued uh, information and data by the experts uh, from various authorities. Uh, the Central Administration for Seed Testing and Certification, as a controlling and uh, monitoring uh, authority, plays an important role to ensure high quality seeds of purity and high germination rate free from weeds, uh, insects and diseases, because it is the only competent uh, accreditation uh, body authorized, authorized by the Ministry of Agriculture and Land Reclamation in Egypt to carry out its uh, supervisory role in the production and handling of seeds. Controlling exported and uh, imported seeds that conform to the international standards as well as its role in the protection of plant varieties and varieties tests to be registered in Egypt as for its impact uh, on the uh, production, uh, protection of the farmers and the breeders' rights. Uh, also, in a few words, I will mention a brief uh, about 
uh, tasks, rules, and tasks. Uh, first, it participates in accordance with legislative uh, frameworks in all stages. Uh, starts with the evaluation tests of the variety, preparing it for the registration uh, and procedures and its inclusions in the national variety lists. Uh, extracts and issues all li license and permissions for the main uh, infrastructures uh, in the field of seed industry, controls uh, the field uh, of seed production, attends the plant, the planting and ensuring the adoption of the appropriate ag agriculture cycle, ensures that the plants uh, are pure and that is free of diseases, supervises and controls of the transfer of raw seeds after harvest from the production fields until they reach the, they reach the stations of the uh, seed preparation. Uh, also, it follow up and uh, supervises and controls the stations of seed preparations and packaging in order to ensure packages of certified seeds with labels containing the elements of qual quality. Uh, it has five locations for carrying DOS testing and uh, field control of seed quality. Uh, it also had 13 seed testing stations in the governorates and the central laboratory accredited by ISTA. Uh, also, uh, CASC uh, is a member in several international organizations, including, of course, ISTA, OECD, COMESA, ECORDA, EPOV, and Union Africa. Uh, CASC also includes uh, several technical uh, secretaries in the seed field, as uh, Seed Council, Agriculture Crop Registration Committee, and Agriculture Crop Committee. Uh, at the end, I hope uh, to see you here, all you, of, here, of you here in Egypt as soon as this difficult time is ending. Uh, again, thank you all of you, and thank you, Dr. Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simak. Please give our best uh, wishes also to Dr. Ahmed. Right. And I thank really you. hope to see him again in Egypt or at any other ISTA event or other events in future. Of of course. Thank you. Steve, as president of ISTA, you have the final words of the whole seminar. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you, Valerie, for, for organizing this seminar and on behalf of ISTA. Um, I think it's been very well organized from the initial planning with, with Rita Zeccanelli and the other organizers when it was planned to be in Italy, but now Plan, plan to also be in uh, Egypt, but again, that couldn't happen because of the, the COVID pandemic. So I very much appreciate everybody's efforts to allow this virtual event. And I think it has been very successful, Valerie, like you said, on all the different three sessions, you've had over 200 people registered, being able to see the presentations online via YouTube and also link onto the individual PowerPoint presentations. It is a, is a great advantage for people. If they can't join us on this time zone, they can then study again later. So um, COVID has some bad downsides, but also it's allowed us to investigate the virtual world a bit more. So I think it's great to hear about your plans for Seed Health Committee in the future, making use of that platform. But I also hope we can get back to physical meetings, which would have been great to have in Egypt with our, with our hosts there and in the future other events. So I, I don't want to end without thanking the organizers, the secretariat, Andreas as the moderator, and also you, Valerie, and also to remember Terry. Um, I think you very poignantly um, dedicated the meeting to Terry at the start, and, and I thank you for that. Terry was a good friend to all of us within the Easter community, and uh, we will miss her. So, so I very much thank you for doing that and organizing this event. And, and um, I hope to see others at, this, uh, at other similar ISTA events in future. So thank you very much, Valerie, and to everybody that's presented um, over the three different sessions. Uh, so over to you, uh, Andreas, uh, as the final moderation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um... Also from our side, thank you to all who participated and um, in the background for Olga Stöckli from the ESTA Secretariat who made all the technical things um, and technical uh, backgrounds for this um, uh, very good um, seminar uh, possible. 
Um, as you said, we will be using this type of tool more in the future. There's also an announcement um, uh, that we will have um, another meeting um, looking into publication of um, scientific data in our journal Seed Science and Technology. Um, that will be in June with the editor-in-chief um, of this journal, uh, Fiona Hay. So that is um, um, a little outlook. We hope that we all see you again uh, and, and uh, topics which are interesting for you um, in future. Uh, our next meeting actually is tomorrow on discussing the changes of the ISTA rules. Um, uh, so you will find details on the ISTA website. Uh, thank you very much to all of you and um, take care and have a good um, day, evening, or morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.